I hail from rural origins, answering to the name Bill Carlson. My educational journey led me through a two-year stint in animal husbandry, with aspirations of owning my own feed store and building a family nest. Upon completing my studies at community college, I joined hands in matrimony with my lifelong flame, Janice. Our roots intertwined since childhood, and she was the sole image of my partner. Janice, adorned with auburn tresses, retained her grace even after bearing two sons. She was the epitome of my pride, and I pledged myself to her every whim. Yet, Janice grappled with one yearning, an admiration for opulence. She found the lure in the columns of high society and indulged in magazines flaunting luxury lifestyles. At the dentist's, she'd leaf through glossy pages showcasing extravagant automobiles, immersing herself in the world of luxury. She was familiar with various designers and their clothing collections. Her biggest desire was to become someone more prominent, which I couldn't fulfill. So, I took a job at a fancy feed store in Omaha that attracted upscale customers. This move brought us closer to the city while allowing me to continue working in my passion. I enjoyed my job and excelled at it, providing personalized service to customers, and was rewarded with flexible working hours. Janice preferred city life over country living and was content for a while. When she decided to join the workforce, we started putting the kids in daycare, which they didn't seem to mind. Janice landed a job at Gilbert Medical, a medical equipment company, where she worked in an office role, enjoying dressing up and meeting people outside the farming community. She became more focused on her career, leaving me to take care of the boys most of the time. I handled dropping them off and picking them up from daycare, preparing meals, and getting them ready for bed. I also took on the responsibility of cleaning the house while she focused on perfecting her wardrobe. We saved money each month with the goal of eventually buying my own feed store. Now, even though she was working, it seemed like we couldn't save any money anymore. A chunk of our earnings went to daycare, but most of it was being spent on beauty treatments, nail salons, and pricey clothes. I couldn't figure out why despite both of us working, our savings were dwindling. Whenever I brought it up, she got defensive and upset, so I stopped mentioning it. Instead, I opened a separate savings account. She started working overtime and receiving private phone calls, becoming less attentive and more distant. She started talking about getting a newer, fancier car and even mentioned breast implants. I was certain she was having an affair. I might be a simple guy, but I wasn't naive. At that point, I didn't even want to save the marriage. I just wanted to sort everything out and move on before it was too late. It was hard to pinpoint anything because I didn't know her co-workers, but I suspected if something was going on, it was with someone from work. I had a couple of good co-workers, Roy and Freddie, who weren't highly educated but worked hard. Even though I was their boss, I never acted like it, and we all worked together seamlessly. They would be important allies in my plan. I noticed that on Wednesdays, Janice would dress up in fancy lingerie and her best clothes. She started taking longer to get ready for work, which gave me an opportunity to put my plan into action. I informed my coworkers about what was happening, and they agreed to cover for me with deliveries and appointments. I parked near the entrance of the Gilbert Medical Plant parking lot, using the time to catch up on some reading. Around 11 a.m., Janice left work and drove to a nearby Holiday Inn. She parked far from the office, and shortly after, a man and a red Corvette arrived and parked at the opposite end of the lot. When they both got out and headed to room 117, my suspicions were confirmed. Feeling disheartened and queasy, I left to return to work, needing time to figure out my next move. Before leaving, I vented my frustration by cutting two of her valve stems with my wire cutters. The rest of the day dragged on, and I later picked up the kids, cooked dinner, and asked Janice about her day. She mentioned having a flat tire which a coworker helped her with, and we didn't discuss it further. The following morning, I swung by the office after dropping off the boys at daycare. It didn't take me long to spot the red Corvette. Lucky for me, the guy had his own reserved parking spot complete with a sign that read Ken Beam, distribution manager. Turns out Roy's wife also worked at Gilbert in the personnel department. By that afternoon, I had all the scoop on this guy. Most importantly, he was already hitched. He'd even caught flack for making inappropriate remarks to a coworker and had some issues with his expense accounts. I scored his address, phone numbers, cell phone digits, and even his SSN, but I had no clue what I'd do with all that intel. Eight years married, his wife's name was Amy. We put in a solid day's work, and Roy, Freddy, and I managed to squeeze in a cold one before I had to pick up the kids. I still wasn't sure what my next move would be, 
but I had a feeling it would all come together soon. Trying to keep calm and think logically, but I was getting angrier by the day. Sometimes I'd catch myself silently tearing up, feeling broken like I couldn't fix myself. Living with Janice was getting tougher by the minute. I just wanted out. Got another stroke of luck the next day when I remembered March Gilbert, one of my top clients, was the wife of the company president at Gilbert Medical. Never met the guy, but March and I clicked. I made sure to butter her up, thinking maybe I could use our friendship to my advantage. That's when March's daughter, Cindy, popped by. She was in her last year of vet school. March went off to do some barn work, and Cindy and I shot the breeze for about an hour. Enjoyed the chat, felt a bit guilty afterward, but it faded fast. Spent the weekend doing some welding in the garage. I crafted a small flat steel piece and attached four sturdy points to it using concrete nails, making sure they were tough and unyielding. The plate measured about six by six, and it marked the beginning of my revenge plan through some well-deserved harassment. Caught sight of March on Tuesday. I was kind of down while unloading the order, not my usual chipper self. Caught her attention. Bill, what's up? You seem off today. Got some personal stuff, March. Sorry, I'm not great company right now. Let's grab some coffee and talk about it. We headed back to the house and settled in the kitchen. It looked like something straight out of a fancy magazine with all that stainless steel and granite. I thought to myself, Janice would flip for this. March put the coffee down, leaned in, and asked, So how can I help you, Bill? Honestly, March, I'm not sure. But maybe talking it out will help. My wife, Janice, works over at Gilbert Medical, and I think she might be getting pressured into something she doesn't want to do with one of her bosses. Problem is, I can't prove it. What makes you think that's happening? Just little things. But last week, I caught them both hanging out at the Holiday Inn. Janice doesn't know I know, and I'm struggling with how to bring it up. I don't know if she's feeling obligated or if she's into it. Our family life's taking a hit, and she doesn't seem to care much about us anymore. She's keeping it all hush-hush, and that's what really bugs me. Who's the guy? I think his name's Ken Beam. I ain't sure if Janice works under him or if they're in different sections of the plant. Never laid eyes on the guy. You want me to see if I can lend a hand? I hesitated a bit and dropped my gaze. If there's a chance to handle this quietly, count me in. But I ain't looking to stir up a hornet's nest. All right. Let me suss it out. See you next Thursday with those oats. I thanked her. Then, as I was getting ready to split, I asked, Where's Cindy? Back at school. She'll be home this weekend. Why don't you bring the boys up so she can meet them? Well, this turned out better than expected. I reckon Janice won't mind if I take the boys out for a bit. Could be a good weekend. Next morning, it's raining cats and dogs. Janice is all decked out for her special day again, and I just kept quiet, watching her. After dropping off the kids at the daycare, I swung by work. The guys were all set to cover my morning shifts. Roy was going to use my truck to make the deliveries and log everything. I just needed to sign off once I got back. Freddy brought his cousin's van, and I loaded a floor jack in the back. We attached my steel plate to the lift of the jack. Once the trucks were all loaded, and they took off for their deliveries, I headed to the Holiday Inn, right on schedule. Janice pulled in and parked in the same spot as before. Ken arrived a few moments later, parking in his usual spot. Once they went into the room, I gave them about ten minutes to get settled. Then, in the pouring rain, I hauled the jack out of the van and wheeled it down to Ken's car. I slipped the jack under his ride and cranked it up. It only took a hot minute before I heard that satisfying pop as the nails punched through the oil pan. I lowered it back down and headed to the back of the Corvette. Within seconds, I heard those same pops hitting the fuel tank. Oil and gas started gushing out like crazy. I grabbed the jack, hightailed it back to the van. Whole shebang was done in under a minute. Took a stroll over to Jan's car and sliced up two valve stems. Again, with that, I was ready to roll. Cruised past Ken's ride, flipped the lit cigarette out the window, and took off. Glanced in my rear view and caught sight of the flame shooting up, followed by a bang as I left the lot. Felt a weight lift off my chest. Janice rolled in from work a bit late, skipped supper, and crashed straight into bed. I hung out with the boys for a bit, got them cleaned up, and tucked them in. Ended up crashing on the couch myself that night. Come morning, Janice stayed in bed. 
while I got the boys sorted for daycare, we chowed down on breakfast and hit the road. She didn't budge, didn't say a word. I didn't pry, noticed her car wasn't in the driveway around 9 a.m., just after we loaded up all the trucks. I got a visit from Lt. John Fritz, he seemed all right. He asked me about my work schedule the day before, just the usual deliveries, nothing out of the ordinary. Why well, I wanted to know what I was up to around noon. I grabbed the delivery logs from the day prior and spread them out, showed him each stop, the goods dropped, the unload time, and my initials. He smirked a bit. That's one heck of a log, he said. You guys do this kind of thing every day. Want a peek at the logs from the past month? He shook his head and grinned, left me wondering if that was a good sign or not. Got something you want to spill? It took a bit of prodding, but he finally spilled the beans. Apparently, there was a car wreck at the Holiday Inn over in East Omaha yesterday, and they're trying to piece together what went down. Why me though? Well, turns out another car nearby had its valve stems sliced, and guess whose car it was? Your wife's. They're wondering if it's just a crazy coincidence or if there's more to it. First off, I have no clue why my wife's car would be at the Holiday Inn, and secondly, what's the deal with her car being connected to the wreck? Oh, her car belonged to a colleague she had a lunch meeting with. They were schmoozing some company clients at the hotel and bam. All this happens during their lunch. Did you talk to the folks they lunched with? Nah, they drew a blank on names. You going to level with me or are we going to dance around all morning? He leaned back, flashed a grin. Ever heard of a guy named Jim? Never crossed paths with him, honest truth. I'll take your word for it. He grinned again. Hate getting mixed up in domestic stuff, so let's hope I don't gotta swing by again. Here's my card, give me A. Shout if anything else pops up. All right, he shook my hand. Hate to drop this on you, let me know if you need anything. All right. As he walked off, I mumbled, thanks, but you didn't really tell me squat. Time to connect the dots. Got home after work, and Janice's ride was parked in the driveway. She was chilling, dinner ready. Said she wasn't feeling great, so she called in sick. Still didn't spill about what went down, so I let it be. She hit the hay early, and I took care of the boys once more, crashing on the couch. Next day, she was up and about, getting ready for work when I left with the boys for daycare. After dropping them off, I swung by the doc's office and asked for an STD check. Friday at work was just like any other. Got home, and Janice was there again. After dinner, I suggested taking the boys to one of my customers' farms the next day, asked if she wanted to join. Knowing she'd likely pass, she mentioned having shopping to do, so I let it slide. Didn't matter to me if it was shopping or a date, same outcome either way. Saturday with Cindy and the boys at Gilbert's Ranch was a blast. We had a blast all day long. March whipped up an amazing lunch. Didn't want it to end. Cindy clicked with the boys, and they seemed to dig her too. Mr. Gilbert wasn't around. So, I still missed meeting him. March didn't bring up our previous chat, and Cindy seemed clueless about it. Hated to head home, but we had to. Janice didn't ask a thing about our day, didn't seem interested. Boys tried telling her about their adventures, but she tuned them out. Gave up after a while. She did wonder why I wasn't sleeping in bed anymore, so I told her work stuff had me tossing and turning. That was that. Rest of the week was business as usual. Noticed she didn't do anything special on her usual day. Figured she called off the truce. Was cool with me cause I had a ton of work piled up. Swung by a divorce lawyer I'd heard about, got some pamphlets and forms. All back to normal till next Wednesday. She started her day with a morning shower, then took extra care with her hair. She had on some new black sultry lingerie, and a fresh scent of perfume lingered around her. Even her shoes looked brand spanking new. I made sure not to get caught staring and hurried out with the boys. Knew for sure it was going to be a date day. Dropped the boys off, swung by the plant, checked out his parking spot. A shiny new Porsche was parked there. Quickly noted down the license plate and dashed back to work. The guys were just as hyped about this new development as I was. We blitzed through the morning deliveries, tweaked the logs a bit. Figured John Fritz might see through it, but went ahead anyway. Had a nice long lunch break. Roy kept up with the deliveries while Freddy swung by the pool supply store, grabbed some big bottles of hydrochloric acid. I wanted to have lunch with John Fritz. 
When I walked into his office with pulled pork sandwiches and fries, he gave me a weird look. Said hi, sat across from him. He knew something was up, grinned like a Cheshire cat. Told him I thought we could grab lunch together and he could fill me in on the car damage case. Had to keep him occupied for about two hours. It was going to be a stretch while I played nice. Freddy was down at the Holiday Inn parking lot, found the Porsche, and drenched it in acid. Trunk, fenders, deck, even the leather seats and floor mats. Sprinkled some mothballs in the gas tank for good measure. Could mess up the engine bad if anyone tried to start it. Left some acid on the tires too before he left. Snipped the valve stems on Janice's car again just to cover our tracks. It was all done and dusted in just 15 minutes. Only downside was not knowing how long they'd be in there. John and I shot the breeze for what felt like ages until he finally asked, What's your game, buddy? Just wanted to make sure I had a solid alibi in case something went down with Ken Beam's car today. What's so special about today? He asked. Well, the pulled pork sandwiches were on special, I quipped. Dialed up the daycare center on my cell. Hey Carol, it's Bill. Got tied up at work and was hoping you could give Janice a buzz to pick up the boys this afternoon. Thanks a bunch. Gave her Janice's number, extension 117. Call her ASAP, okay? John leaned back, chuckling. Those pork sandwiches hit the spot. There was a low, then he said, should I ring Mr. Bean and check on his car? Why bother? I asked, you wouldn't happen to know where I could find him, would you? I rattled off his cell and the hotel room number. Take your pick, John put the phone on speaker and dialed the hotel. After a few rings, Ken Beam picked up, sounding out of breath. Who's this? Detective Fritz here, John replied. Just wanted to update you, no leads on messed with your car. Why are you calling me? How'd you get this number? I work in law enforcement, Mr. Beam. Got yourself a new ride yet? Yep, just got it. Why the question? Just checking to avoid any repeats of the last time. Where's the car now? It's parked outside. Everything all good with it? Let me take a look. We could hear Ken rustling around as he peeked out the window at the parking lot. A few mutters later, he got back on the line. Something seems off. I've got to get dressed and investigate. I'll ring you back soon. Fair enough, but why aren't you dressed already, Mr. Beam? None of your business. Gotta go. They hung up, and John shot me a grin, satisfied. Absolutely. Well, I've got to head back to the grind. If you need anything, give me a shout. Sure thing. Maybe we'll grab lunch again next week. Hope not. Got to wrap this up before someone gets hurt. Back to the salt mines I went. Roy had the logs in ship shape, and Freddy had stashed the acid where no one would find it. Tonight at home was bound to be a doozy. Janice scooped up the boys without a word and hit the hay early. Next day, John popped by. He filled me in on the car carnage, mentioning Ken's insurance claim. Since the Corvette kerfuffle, the car was totaled, setting Ken back over sixty grand. He was still pointing fingers at me despite John vouching for my whereabouts. Sure, John knew I was involved, but he wasn't about to spill the beans. I never did find out how Janice got her tires fixed. Didn't ask, and no one offered since Janice never came clean about the mess. I figured it was time to pull the plug. My STD. Test came back clean, and I'd kicked off the divorce paperwork with the lawyer. I had this idea to head over to the Gilberts Ranch this weekend with the boys, just in case Cindy showed up. If not, we'd chill with March. But I still hadn't nailed down any solid proof of Janice's extramarital shenanigans. The weekend went smooth. Cindy was there, and the kids were over the moon. We had a blast, felt like a real family again. We all missed that vibe big time. Cindy was still clueless about the drama, but at least she wasn't prying. Before I split, March gave me a reassuring pat on the back and said, everything's going to be alright. Then, out of the blue, I got offered this new gig about 100 miles away. More cash, a better gig, and even the chance to buy into the business down the line. It sounded like a dream, except for one hitch, it meant being far from Cindy. Next thing I knew, it's Wednesday, and Janice is all decked up again. No clue what wheels her new man was rolling, but she was clearly prepping for another rendezvous. I figured they were still hitting up the same joint. I knew I had to do something, but I hadn't really thought it through. 
Me and the guys were brainstorming when March Gilbert pulls up. She motions for me to hop in, and before I know it, we're at the plant, sneaking in through the back like VIPs. Straight to Mr. Gilbert's office, March makes the intros. We get coffee, shoot the breeze for a bit, then I finally asked, What's the deal, Mr. Gilbert? Chuckles time to wrap this up. March fills me in on the scoop, says they've done some digging in-house. Once everything's set, we'll hit the ground running. Should have all the dirt you need by day's end. If I do anything to embarrass you, Bill, I'm sorry in advance. Not my intention to step on toes. We shoot the breeze a bit more, and March catches my grin when talk turns to Cindy. I try to play it cool, but I'm pretty obvious. Then the phone rings, and suddenly everyone's on high alert. What's the word? Got it. Thanks for the heads up. You know what to do now, right? Mr. Gilbert flashed a grin and gave the green light. Okay, everything's set. Let's kick things off. Your wife and Ken are holed up in their usual spot at the Holiday Inn. Ken used a company vehicle to get there, which, by the way, goes against company rules, so we're bringing it back to the plant pronto. Hate to break it to you, but it seems like your wife's got a couple of flat tires again. Seems like it's becoming a bit of a routine. He put the phone on speaker and punched in the room number. Hey, Ken, it's Mr. Gilbert. Sorry to bug you, but we need to have a serious chat. Ken stumbled over his words a bit. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. What's up? How'd you even get this number? That's not the point, Ken. What matters is that our legal team's been tipped off about a possible harassment issue. I need straight answers here, buddy, so listen up. Is there a female employee there with you? There was a pause, some murmuring in the background. Yes, sir, there is. Is she there by choice, or is there any kind of pressure from you? No, sir. Not at all, sir. So, it's all consensual? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Everything's consensual. Fantastic. I see, thanks for being straight with me on this. We'll draft up a statement to clear this up. Now, can I speak to the young lady? After some commotion, Janice got on the line. Sir, what can I do for you? Janice, did Ken coerce or threaten you into coming with him? No, sir, he didn't threaten me. That's good to hear. So, the closeness was consensual, and you didn't feel pressured at all, is that right? After a pause and some chatter in the background, Janice spoke up again. Yes, yes, sir. It was consensual. Great to hear. When you and Ken get back to the plant, we'll have those statements ready for you to sign. Ken, can you hop back on? Ah, uh, how'd you know my name? Don't sweat it, Ken. Not important. Just head back to the plant so. We can square this away with the legal team. He ended the call with a grin. March, why don't you take Bill out for a bite and swing by later? The legal folks should wrap things up by then, and we can all move on with our lives. Lunch was fantastic. I struggled to contain my gratitude, but I couldn't thank her enough. Eventually, March convinced me to seal our lips about the whole ordeal. She also made me vow not to breathe a word to Cindy. It was a promising sign. I filled March in on the job offer, and she was happy for me and the boys back at the plant. Post-lunch, I snagged notarized copies of Ken and Janice's statements. They both swore up and down that their extramarital affairs were consensual. The legal crew assured me it was enough ammo for my lawyer to fire off the divorce papers. Ken and Janice got the boot. Their desks were cleared out before they even showed up, and they were shown the door. Unfortunately, they didn't have wheels. March let me borrow her car and said I could return it the next day. I dropped off the paperwork at the lawyers and got extra copies made. One set was for Ken's wife. Then I hit the bank and closed our accounts, squared off the credit cards, and then I rang up the utility companies to cut off services by Friday afternoon. Swinging by John Fritz's, I gave him the update, he chuckled. I gave the landlord a heads up I wouldn't be renewing the lease. At work, I handed him my notice, they were supportive but bummed to see me go. Freddie trailed me to the Gilbert Ranch with my truck so I could return March's wheels. It was time to fetch the boys and head home. I wasn't looking forward to stepping through the door. Janice's ride wasn't in the driveway when we walked in, she was on the couch in tears. It was the first time she'd shown any emotion. Two boxes of her stuff from work were stacked nearby. I fed the boys and turned on the TV, standing by in case she wanted to talk. 
You had to go and do it, didn't you? She sobbed. You had to wreck everything in my life. Why couldn't you just mind your own business? You had no right to interfere with mine. I was stunned. She still viewed everything as if the world orbited around her. The kids and I were mere background noise to her. She couldn't care less about Amy, our family, our life, or our plans. It was like they meant nothing to her. All she cared about was her own immediate desires. Honestly, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders knowing I wouldn't be stuck with her for life. I kept quiet and headed for a shower. Later, while I got the boys ready for bed, she retreated to the bedroom and shut the door. The next day, I brought the boys along to work. I just wanted to tie up any loose ends and make sure Roy and Freddy were on top of the system I'd set up. We hit up some stores to gather boxes for the move. Passing by the hotel, Janice's car was missing, so I figured she must have gotten it fixed by now. Those flat tires must have put a dent in her shopping spree budget for the past month. When we got home, Janice wasn't around. We only grabbed clothes and toys, everything else stayed put for Janice to deal with. Little did she know that by the next day, all the utilities would be cut off. Damn, fate was a cruel one. As we backed out of the driveway, Janice was just pulling in. She stood by her car, watching silently as we drove away. I treated the boys to Chuck E. Cheese and booked a motel for the night. The next morning, I dropped them off at daycare. I handed Carol some cookies and party favors, explaining it was the boys' last day, and I wanted them to have a blast with their buddies before I left. Carol pulled me aside. What's the deal with your wife last week? She asked. I didn't want to pry, but since you're leaving, I'm dying to know. She was furious when I called, I admitted. She demanded to know where I got that number, and when I told her you gave it to me, she cursed up a storm. When she picked up the boys, she didn't say a word, but her vibe screamed anger. I owe you an apology, Carol, I confessed. I kind of put you in a tough spot. You see, Janice was having an affair. She was holed up at the hotel with her boyfriend, and I hoped. If I got you to call and break up their little rendezvous, she'd reconsider the whole thing. But it backfired, instead, she got ticked off at both of us. I'm serving her with divorce papers this afternoon, and right after I pick up the boys, we're hitting the road for a new job. I admit it was a low move on my part, and I'm sorry for dragging you into it. I met with my divorce lawyer, and everything was set to go. I'd have custody of the kids, and Janice could see them whenever she wanted. Honestly, I didn't think she'd be all that interested in them anyway. We split everything else down the middle, although there wasn't much to split, no alimony, no child support, no cash settlements. I left her all the furniture, appliances, and household stuff. I didn't want any of it. She kept her car too, I didn't want it, those flat tires were a pain. All I had to do was hand the papers to Janice. If she didn't fight it, everything would be wrapped up in three months. Attached to the divorce paperwork was a copy of Ken and Janice's notarized statements. The lawyer made a little note in the margin indicating that the statements would stay private if we could agree on all the terms of the divorce. There were no questions. Her car was in the driveway, so I knew she was home. I sat there for what felt like forever. I loved Janice, she was the only woman I ever got close to. I thought our relationship was normal, never realizing I wasn't meeting her needs. She never came out and told me directly, and I was too clueless to pick up on all the hints she dropped. I let her down in so many ways. What she did was sneaky, but I also felt like some of it was because I wasn't paying enough attention. I knocked on the door of our own home, and it felt strange. She opened it, looking worn out. She offered me a drink, but I just handed her the papers. She didn't even bother to open them, just glanced at them and then back up at me. Why? I asked, unsure if she was angry or sad. After a few moments, she finally spilled it out. He smelled like cologne while you smelled like dirt. He wore fancy suits while you were in jeans. He dined on lobster and steak while you settled for ribs and burgers. He strutted around in a designer coat, but yours was a workman's jacket. He drove a fancy car, but you were content with your truck. His nails were always clean and polished, while yours were perpetually grimy. He had a prestigious job, while you were just a country boy. Is that enough for you? I could keep going all day if you want. I was hoping for a life that you couldn't give me, she continued. I'm sorry we got married, Bill. I married you for the wrong reasons. I thought you could rescue me from my family, but I didn't think ahead enough. 
I'm truly sorry for that, but I can't change how I feel. I love our kids, but I regret having them. It sounds awful, but I don't seem to have that maternal instinct. I thought finding someone who could fulfill my dreams would make me happy, but it just made me more dissatisfied with where I am now. I owe you an apology. I didn't tell you the truth. I regret not being a better mom to my kids, but I'm not sorry for going after my dreams and searching for something more. What about her spouse? What about your partner? What about your kids? What about your folks? Her attitude changed instantly. My question seemed to tick her off, and she didn't seem remorseful anymore. I don't give a damn about any of that stuff, she snapped. It's my turn now. I want to live the life I've always dreamed of, having a husband from the countryside and two grubby kids who don't lift a finger, won't, don't help me get there. I've got your stupid papers now. Just get out so I can move on with my life. Well, that made things simple. I just turned around and walked out. When I picked up the boys, Carol offered to make more calls if I needed. I contacted the utility companies and told them to hold off on disconnecting until the end of the month. I felt a twinge of pity for her. I suppose the divorce was finalized in three months. I never heard a peep from Janice. The attorney said everything went according to plan. My new job was fantastic, though I missed out on the opportunity to buy into the business, someone else snagged it along with a chunk of prime land. My boss mentioned they were turning it into a horse breeding farm. My position was secure, but my chance at owning my own place took a hit. Two weeks later, construction began next to the feed store. We were all curious about what was being built, and eventually one of the guys asked the site engineer. It turned out to be a veterinary clinic specializing in treating large animals. I found that intriguing, but I shrugged it off as wishful thinking. They managed to erect the entire building in less than 60 days. The new owner was expected to arrive on Saturday. On our way to grab some lunch, the boys and I swung by for a look. I was a bit curious. Out of the blue, both boys started yelling, Cindy! Cindy! And lo and behold, there she was, looking better than ever. In the beginning, March stood beside her faithfully. Cindy had achieved her dream of becoming a veterinarian and had ambitious plans to breed show horses while managing a thriving large animal clinic. While she gave the boys a tour of her new facility, March and I caught up on old times. Later, we all enjoyed lunch together, during which Cindy shared her excitement about constructing a new home on the property to be closer to her work. As we headed home that evening, the joy on our faces was undeniable. Five years later, Cindy was flourishing, nurturing beautiful horses and overseeing a highly successful clinic. Meanwhile, I had just inaugurated my sixth feed store. Our family had grown, with the boys now having two little sisters whom they absolutely adored. Every weekend, our home was filled with visits from my mother-in-law, March, and Mr. Gilbert, whose first name remained a mystery. However, noticeably absent from these gatherings was Janice, who never seemed to find the time to visit the boys.